welcome everybody to this magical session of Embodied Impact, where one of our primary focuses is around exploring the relationship between sexuality and abundance. Our ethos is centered around how we show up more presently in our sexuality, so we can be more available in the world to contribute more mindfully and from a position of abundance. Today, we have the privilege of sharing the space with Eric Everhard. Uh, Eric is one of the top paid and most recognized performers in adult films of the last two decades, winning numerous male performer awards, being enshrined in the Hall of Fame of the AVN and the XRCO organizations. In 2010, he embarked on a transformational journey studying NLP and becoming dedicated to helping high achievers learn elite level sexual skills, and I love this, in order to master the bedroom like they dominate the boardroom. I was very, very fortunate in having the opportunity of speaking a few times with Eric in, in Clubhouse. And look, the conversations went to every single angle, which, which you could imagine. But I think today, there's, I'm, I'm super excited. I know Toby is as well. I'm sure all of the listeners are. And just wanted to say a warm welcome to Eric. Glad to have you here with us. Thank you very much. I'm uh, I'm honored to be here. And uh, yeah, we did have a lot of really good conversations, but I have a feeling this one's going to be a little bit better because, you know, on, on these platforms, it really feels like the gloves can come off, so to speak. So <clears throat> amazing. Amazing. Um, I'm going to jump in right now because I've, I've read your book and your book is spectacular. Um, like I said to you before. And one of the things that struck me right in the beginning was this idea that Hollywood has lied to all of us. And it's, it's this, I guess, this, this convoluted lie, in my opinion, that there's this belief that we should be a particular way as men. What's, can you speak into that a little bit? What do you think that sort of view is that Hollywood has created for us? Well, I know from from what I've seen, and you know, I, I map everything onto my my experience and what I experienced, especially through the lens of the porno industry of the last twenty three years. And I find it it really taught me a lot about the different interdynamics and plays between men and women. And you know, one of the great lies that I always felt um, gets perpetuated by Hollywood is this sort of it's it well there's a lot of lies so we'll go into some of them i mean one of them is you know that uh you know the nice guy always gets the girl at the end of the day that's that's one of the big you know perpetuated lies and it's not that it's not about being nice right it, it, but there is a there's a difference between being sexual and making your um your wants and and needs known to the other person and just hanging around like a best friend and then magically waking up one day like uh like like snow white or or you know or the princess and saying you know what i really like that guy all of a sudden you know like so <clears throat> what i've seen is guys don't have a lot of agency running their lives when they just you know, get inundated with what Hollywood tells them, you know, this is how you should be as a man. And you sort of have to parse it out as a, as a guy, right? You need to get out there and you say, okay, well, what, you know, what is working? Not what, what, what do I think or what, or what should be, but what, what is, how do people respond? You know, how do they respond to you? Um, you know, from an attraction level, how do they respond to you sexually and, and what works sexually? Right. Because, again, you know, we we often get inundated with, you know, something that, you know, Cosmopolitan tells us or or this magazine tells us or this TV show tells us. And, you know, when I was out there just in the trenches, I was like, none of this seems to be mapping into my experience. You know, when I think about it from a boots on the ground perspective. So that was kind of what I've seen, you know, when I think about, well, you know, sort of different lies that Hollywood does perpetuate. And, and it's tough because, you know, I think for a lot of guys these days, you know, it, it sort of almost feels like a lost generation of men, right? Like we don't know how to be anymore because, you know, on, on one side, you know, the, the society tells us, well, we should be this way. And then women are telling us, well, we should be this way. And then we don't even know which way we're supposed to be. And so I started to think, well, 
rather than thinking about how we how we should be, we should be thinking about well, well, well what is working, right? And kind of start from there. <clears throat> It's a really nice. It's a nice simplified sort of entry point to to sort of the the experiential. And I think what what I often encounter with a lot of men is is that, like you say, we don't really know how to define ourselves according to all the the expectations that society has. Um, but taking a stance of sorts at least allows you entry into experience, and from there you can start navigating that space. Exactly. I think what I also love about when I was reading your book is you really take it as a scientist. Okay, if you want to know what works, go run the experiment. And I mean, just in the beginning of your book, and I want to get right into this, it's like basically you start with like eating pussy. This is mm -hmm. like one of the like, you say it's the grand delineator between men. And I, I really love it. And if, if we can actually get into this for sort of like unleashing the, the sexual superpowers, like what what have you found? What works? What doesn't work? Where do men kind of like sidetrack or? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, for me, so I love the fact that you said it was like a science experiment because it really was, you know, here you, it was just for me, it was such an interesting position to be in because, you know, if you if we if we think about, you know, regular life and i and i don't want to downplay that because you know we we are all regular people but you know if you're out there in regular life well you know we we got to say well how many women are you sleeping with in a year right that would be different enough that you would now be able to experiment and not only just experiment but have real time feedback because it's one thing if you think well oh you know what maybe if I did this next time, it would work. But then if it's six months before you get a chance to try it out and you don't really get any feedback before you get to try it out on the next person, it's tough to get that immediate sense of what's working and what's not, right? So when I started, you know, as a young guy, like I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just like, okay, like we're, we're doing this and you're starting to feel for things, right? And I was like, so after a while, that's when I started to notice, okay, well, now I'm starting to see, or I'm starting to have some success. But again, well, 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 why? And why did it work on girl A, but it didn't work on girl B? And on girl C, it sort of worked. And on girl D, there was absolutely nothing. You know, like, okay, well, again, what what is the thread of commonality? And that's where I started to see, you know, where, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the overarching principles I discovered never change. It was really, once you understood what the principles were, then it was application of the principles that would be different. And that would be very individual, right? So if we're looking at it from the base principle, what I discovered was, okay, look, you know, analogous to a guy getting an erection, you have the woman having a clitoral erection. And that was the one thing that you could trust. It was the one thing that wouldn't lie to you because it's there or it's not. It's black or it's white. The sun is setting or the sun is, you know, or, or is, is rising, right? Like it's, it's there. And, and you're like, okay, well now, now that I have this, and once you really attune your, what I call your, your tongue compass, right? Because your compass always ports, points to true north. And that is what your tongue is telling you. It's telling you what's working and what's not in a, in a, moment to moment basis. So it's it's almost like, you know, if we were to look at it through the lens of say like NFL football, it's like, well, you get to the line of scrimmage and then suddenly you see something different. What does the quarterback do? He calls an audible, different play, right? Because now what I'm seeing in front of me requires something different. And so you're approaching the clip the same way, right? It's like, okay, well, I'm going in, I'm trying, you know, my first technique and I'm like, okay, well, what is the clip telling me? Am I getting feedback? Am I getting some clitoral engagement? Am I not, right? If I am, okay, is it starting to get harder and it's increasing in, in, in its hardness? Or if I keep doing this, is it starting to go down? If it's going down, okay, what needs to change, right? And that's where we sit back and we say, okay, well, your, your, your things that you're going to be changing is going to be either speed or it's going to be pressure or it's going to be fundamentally the technique, right? And so then you're, you're sitting there and you're parsing out and you're feeling in the moment, 
which one of those things need to change and you're altering them slightly to see again, do I get that clitoral engagement again? Because that that is your your base level as I look at it, right? Because you know, if we're if we're thinking about as men, you know, and I always take this through the viewpoint of men because you know, th- those are who I coach and that's my experience, right? I don't have a female experience, I have a very male experience. So, you know, if we're if we're looking at things that we can fundamentally, you know, trust, that's number one. Because, you know, okay, if if a girl's gonna be faking an orgasm and you know, if we're if 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 she's going there, which you know, no woman wants to do. I mean, I firmly believe no woman wants to have to do it. It's like that is the Hail Mary of this is a miserable sexual experience and I just want it to be over. But m- women are on your team. Like they, you know, I mean, if she's if she's naked with you in the bed, she is, I mean, fuck, she is hoping. She is praying that you are the one, right? Like she's really behind you because otherwise she wouldn't be, she wouldn't have put herself in a situation to have this sexual experience with you. So she's really on your side. So if you, if you're not measuring up, then, you know, it's for her, it's, it's just as much of a, of a letdown, right? That she has to do that to have it end. But when we're looking at things that we can rely on, well, first we're we're relying on that clitoral engagement. Then if we have that, now we have other metrics that we can start to trust right? Because now we can trust that auditory because by itself, well, it could be something or it could be, you know, just fakery. But if we have the clitoral engagement and we have the hard, the hard clitoral erection, now we can say, okay, well now very likely what we're listening to from an auditory perspective is good, right? Then we're going to be paying attention to the wetness and then we're going to be paying attention to tension because you know, tension is something we all go through when we're close to having an orgasm, right? Like your body just tenses up, you know, you, people will always reference, oh, it's a toe curling orgasm. Well, because everybody always gets really tense when they're at that moment, right? So again, when you feel the tension in them, now it's another feedback mechanism that can say, well, I'm probably going down the right rabbit hole here. So you bring all these things together and then you're able to, you know, have lift off, so to speak. <clears throat> One of the quotes that you, you, you do make reference to is the girl controls the decision and the guy controls the act. Mm-hmm. I found that very, very, very sort of profound. Can, can you speak into that? Well, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting, right? Because if you, at least for how I've always seen it and, and what's mapped with my experience, you know, if we were to go, you know, and I talk about it in the book, right? Like if we were to go into a bar, right? And it was me and some super hot girl, right? And we go into the bar and the girl just puts her hand up and just yells to the crowd, hey, who wants to fuck me here tonight? Every dude is putting his hand up, right? Like, because we've got 17 times higher testosterone than women. We're, we're, the, we're the chasers when it comes to it, but we're not the deciders, we're all putting our hat in the ring, but I mean, the, the woman is going to be choosing. I think um, David Data said it best in the way of the superior man. Choose the woman who chooses you. So women are always going to be the ones choosing. You know, the women are, are the, the really the gatekeepers of the sexual experience. So they're going to be choosing from who they like. But then when we flip it to the actual sex is going to occur, now we're just in the area of the man. Because functionally for any sort of penetrative sex to happen, it's all up to him, right? If he can't get the heart on, doesn't matter that she's as horny as a tigress in heat and wants to pounce on him. It's not happening. Uh, if he can't last more than 30 seconds and, and he orgasms in 30 seconds, it's over. It's over, right? Like it, it doesn't matter how much she wanted it to go for 30 minutes or 40 minutes or two hours, it's not happening. So from that, from that physical standpoint, you know, the act of it is totally in 100% in control of the man. And, and, you know, that's a thing that, that is sort of interesting because, you know, it, it does create a burden on men. And I think, you know, there's a lot of it where, 
we could say, well, that burden's not fair. And, and I agree, we could say it's not, but it's just how it is. So I think always, you know, from a, from a male perspective, I always tell my clients, I say, look, you, you got to rise to the occasion and meet the challenge and not shy away from it because you're never going to be able to shy away from it. Hmm. You know, the, the, the burden of performing is just resting on your shoulders and that's just how the universe says it's going to be. There's a, there's a real, there's a unique speak about, got to be. No, I just wanted to, to pick up on because before we came on, you were speaking about the, uh, the mental versus the physical hard on. Mm -hmm. And I mean, also here, um, Aidana in, in the in the chat is saying, yeah, men come and it's over and women come and goes on. But maybe you can also speak about kind of like the multi-orgasmicness in, in that sense. Oh, from, a, from the perspective of men having a multi-orgasm? Yeah, potentially, yeah. And like, what, what's your sort of like experience in the in that field well so i i've never experienced that one myself um i've been interested in going down down the rabbit hole of it um what i found has been very useful though um especially in in terms of functionality you know because i'm i always try and map things where it's like okay well how can i make sex better you know for the general population of people right because you know, a lot of guys out there, they're, they're struggling just to be able to last five minutes, right? Like this is, this is the, a, a real concern. And what I've noticed some clients have done, which generally I'm against because it can bite you in, in the ass in the end is, you know, maybe they're going to have a sort of, you know, sexual encounter with a woman. And so they think because they're, they, they might deal with premature ejaculation issues. They think, well, okay, let me just get the first one done in 30 seconds and then I can go for round two. Except that sometimes your penis doesn't want to go for round two. And so I've always found, you know, even, even working as an actor, you're, you're better off finding a way to hold that, that in and have better quality than better quantity of orgasm. And so by doing that, you know, if you can, if you can ride that fine line, right, if you can find a way to keep your, your sensitivity, to keep your, your ability right on the, right on the edge of orgasm. But if you can draw that out for 20, 30, 40 minutes, it's more enjoyable for you. And functionally, you're going to be able to stay hard the entire time. Because if you, if you think, well, okay, let me, let me. Let me get rid of one of these quickly to be able to quote unquote last longer. Sometimes just your, your, your physiology says no. And we don't even know why. I mean, that's the interesting thing. You know, that's kind of what I was talking about with the, with the mentally created hard on versus the, the physically created hard on. I mean, the, ideally we'd like to be able to have both at all times, Right. But the thing about the mentally created hard on what I've noticed is, okay, it can be stronger, but it's unreliable and unrepeatable, right? You could, you could be making out with your girlfriend on Monday and suddenly out of nowhere, you know, you're just hard in your pants and you are ready to go. Um, you, you make out with her on Wednesday and, and it's nothing. Why? Like, what was the fundamental difference? We don't know. Right. There, there's, you know, it's one of those things where it's almost like we're kind of putting our finger up in the air like, OK, you know, do, do the do the erectile gods say today is is the day that we just magically get get hard just from kissing our girlfriend. And, and then the next day we're not. So when I say about unreliable and unrepeatable, that's what I mean, because, you know, there's a whimsical whimsicalness to it that we just can't seem to understand. But you can always take matters into your own hand and you can always create the physically created hard on. And sometimes, sometimes that's good enough. I mean, I've always said, you know, if we're going to go, if you're going to go party in Las Vegas, do you care if you drive there or if you fly? Well, both are enjoyable. Both are, you know, we're just going to party, right? So it's the same way, like whether... <laughs> Whether whether it's the 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 mentally created hard on or it's the physical created hard on, you're going to be able to functionally have a great 
um, you know, enjoyment of sex with the person that you're having it with. And that's all that matters. You, you, going, going back to, to sort of the, 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 the clit is your compass or our compass. Mm-hmm. I think it makes so much sense in terms of the, the, the bodily side that you're speaking about as well, because I think the feedback mechanism that we have with us in our body, as much as you sort of going down on your partner or, or a woman for that matter, and actually using that as that feedback mechanism to really guide you through that process, the same thing can be done with the body. And, and I love how you position that. Um, I, I, that was one of the quotes that I think in this book that I think will always stay with me is, is that it's, it, the clit is our compass, but it's the feedback that we're looking for. It's the mechanism of that feedback, which is, mm-hmm. I guess, another way of also saying it is, is taking yourself so out of your head and putting yourself so deeply in your body that you're, you're present. There's nothing more to it, right? Well, yeah, and it's 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 also, you know, the the beautiful thing about that too is when 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 that is where your focus is, right? Like you are sitting there and you are just intently focused on feeling the minute changes because they are minute. Like you do have to feel them. You can feel the the clits getting five percent, ten percent harder, or it's going down five or ten percent, and it takes a while to get used to that, but by having that dedicated focus, well, the other benefit about that is, well, you're not in your head anymore. Hmm. Right? You know, because so, so often, you know, what, what is it that people struggle with? You know, they, they, they get inside their head and then they get, you know, wrapped up in, in, in anxiety, performance anxiety. You know, what does she think about me? Am I doing a good job? Do I know what I'm doing? All these things. It's like, well, you can't be having those thoughts and be 100% focused on what you're doing. You know, it's the same thing like if, 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 you know, you guys have ever done any sort of breathwork meditation, right? Like when you're, you know, super focused on, on feeling the breath go in, feeling the breath go out, there's no thoughts. But then you have a little slip up and all of a sudden you're thinking about who knows what, groceries, or you're thinking about, you know, what you got to do later. Well, now you're not paying attention to the breath, right? And you're like, well, wait, got to go back. So it, it becomes very much the same thing. But if you can stay at that level of focused attention on your partner, well, now you're doing the double benefit of, well, you're very likely going to be able to get them off. And number two, well, now you're not stuck inside your head, which is the worst place to be. Yeah. Yeah, I feel this whole piece around presence is, is a really big part that I'm, I'm resonating with. And I mean, also just the sort of like observing my partner and, and seeing just things change just no, not even through through touch but simply just through presence and awareness and i'm curious because i mean you've been in the porn industry mm-hmm. and you were saying earlier there sometimes women you just don't feel like you want to have sex with but you need to perform mm-hmm. and so i'm curious to talk here a bit more on the level of kind of like emotional investment versus like purely like physical performance where it's purely acting well and but that's the thing is it's you it's still not acting right like it's 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 a unique place to be because you know if we were truly acting then we would say it was fake right but it's not fake because what we're actually doing is we are actually having sex and we're 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 actively being there and we're actively either trying to create something or we're actively trying to create some sort of connection but we are trying to have something there right so so it's never just acting it's you know what it can be is it can be a compartmentalization of what's going on emotionally right and and there's some benefits and there's some negatives around that right like i think one of the things is certainly that I learned from being in the business for so long was taking the emotions out of it created the most honest feedback. Hmm. And that was the one thing that I really, really noticed because <clears throat> I was thinking a lot about this and I was like, okay, well, let's, let's be realistic. Okay. And, 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 and I thought a long, long time about this. I said, okay, well, where would you have the opportunity to sleep with, you know, 5,000 women, right? And, okay, so if you're Leonardo DiCaprio or Brad Pitt, sure, you will have the opportunity, right? Well, 
if a woman's going to bed with with Leonardo DiCaprio, his performance absolutely does not matter. Because it's this is like, you know, she's not going to be if he if he lasts 30 seconds, she's still ex just as excited. Guess what? I fucked Leo, right? Like it's just the notch on the bedpost, right? So 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 what is Leo learning? Is he learning anything? Because his performance does not matter. Then we can look at it from the complete flip side. Okay, well, because I've known, you know, super millionaires and billionaires, and they can hire 5,000 escorts, and yeah, you could sleep with 5,000 women. Well, what are they learning? Because if, you, if, if unless the escort says you're the most amazing, you know, lay of all time you're not doing a good job you're not going to have that job very long right that's part of part and parcel of the job is to say well you know hey that was great um so again he's not learning really anything either and so now you're in this in this porno world where there is a third party paying both of you and they don't have to like you at all and they certainly are not going to necessarily walk on emotional eggshells for you either so, I mean, I've been in those situations where, you know, as soon as you do something wrong, it's like, oh, no, don't like that. Don't like this, blah, blah, blah. Do this. Okay, go. And you're just like, okay, thanks, right? Like, it's complete brutal honesty in, 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 the, most, in the most brutally honest way. You know, you could be there with somebody where you don't even necessarily like each other, but, you know, you're, you're, you're literally like, like two fighters in a ring you know, you don't like each other, but you've been, both been paid here to do this. And you're like, okay, and go, we can do this, right? So it, it, it's, it's completely honest. And that was the one thing that I noticed about, you know, the 23 years in the business was in every sexual interaction, you know, especially as soon as the camera stopped, you know, you got real, real honest feedback because there was no emotional attachment where they would hold back at all. And that is where I found there to be a ton of learning because, you know, so often out there you're with a partner and nobody wants, you know, especially if you're in love, nobody wants to hurt anybody's feelings. That's the last thing people want to do. But sometimes, sometimes if you don't honestly say what's going on, well, now you just perpetuate bad sex forever. And then nobody wins. One of one of the suggestions I always make when I work with couples in in specific um, is, you know, we aren't responsible for the other's emotional state. We can be holding, we can be present, we can be, you know, many different ways of relating to the sort of emotionality. But it's really down to the other person to deal with the ego attached to that emotional response. And I can imagine just sort of just just even just imagining it for two seconds being in that space where like you say you've been paid to be there with this other person that you don't necessarily know much about and now you have to dance with this person you really have to because it's you know make or break every single time every single time mm -hmm. and i i guess it's 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 quite an interesting space to be when you're forced together and both of you are deciding 110 percent to actually be there and, and I wonder if that's something that most people can actually take from this is that, you know, if you disarm that defensiveness or that sensitivity in a relationship, it really does take you to a far more authentic space. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what's also interesting um, is the fact that when you're when you're in that sort of dynamic, right, where, you know, you show up, you meet somebody there in the makeup chair you literally shake hands and maybe you've had a 15 minute conversation with them if you're lucky. And then next time, you know, then you're suddenly you're naked and it's like action, right? So there's no time to really get to know anything about them. And so what I learned about that was, well, first of all, that communication in and of itself didn't matter that much, right? Like the actual communication is going to be between the bodies. You know, similar to like how people will say, you know, well, what is it? Seven or 10% of, of communication is verbal. The, the other 90% is, is, you know, based on our body language, right? Well, it's the same thing when you're in the bedroom. It's like you can find out so much about somebody 
by feeling their body in the moment way more than you could ever find out by asking them anything. And so what I learned is, you know, when you're in that situation, it really teaches you to really pay attention. Okay, well, what, what am I feeling and what's working? Because, you know, if you're going to be, if you're going to create some real magic, especially even on screen, it's going to come from you being able to find out what is working on this person as fast as possible. And you only have an hour to find that out, right? Like you're, you're in there in the mix and it's like, okay, like I have to find out what gets you off as quick as I can so that we can create something for the viewers that everybody's going to love. And that, you know, not only the viewers are going to love, but you're going to have a good time too, because I always said, you know, from the male's perspective, right. As a male porn star, if you can make the girl that you're with forget that there's a crew, forget that there's a director, forget that there's makeup artists, catering, all if you can get her to forget all that stuff for, you know, 45 minutes and just be and just be there, you know, in kind of that space where where you're not seeing, hearing, or aware of anything else, then you've done your job. Right. And I think that that same principle also you can take into the bedroom just with your significant other. Like where can where can you make them feel like, you know, that they are it and that you are just totally invested and make them forget about, you know, the kids or make them forget about, you know, the bad day at work or make them forget about, you know, what they're thinking about, uh, how they look or how they're performing. If you can make them forget all of that, you've done your job. Eric, honestly, I think, I think just in that one statement alone, you, you have, you've altered the whole narrative that I guess our current day and age in the world of sexology has around, you know, porn usage and pornography and things like that. And I think, you know, I thank you for that because I think that's something so important because a lot of what we speak about in, in, on this platform as well is about masculinity and, you know, really stepping into our, our sort of mature and evolved masculine. Mm -hmm. that's such an important statement so it, it breaks away this this ideology that that porn is number one fake because really it is the coming together of two bodies that are about creating magic um yes it's in a bubble and yes the context is very different but man dude that that's for me that's spot on well you know it, it's interesting because i i do hear that a lot and you know people say well you know porn is fake and i'm like well no it's not right it's that that would be like saying, you know, like, okay, if we watch, you know, the latest Schwarzenegger flick, right? We can say that's fake. But if I watch the Super Bowl, okay, they may be doing superhuman things that I cannot do. But it's live and it's really happening. Like Tom Brady really threw that ball. Yes, that guy really leapt, you know, six feet in the air and caught it on the goal line. And it all really happened. And, and, Porn is more on that side because it's more of a, you know, it's not a movie you're creating. You're documenting something live. So it, it, it is something where you can't say, well, it's fake because, okay, what's fake? It's not, we're not using CGI. These are real people and, they're, and we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes, right? And there's a lot of things there too that, you know, when we talk about porn, a lot of times people don't understand right? It's like at the end of the day, we're there creating a visual product for people. And, and so, you know, even with my clients, like, because a lot of times they'll ask me about, you know, I teach them about positioning and all sorts of stuff. And I'll say, look, there are some things that we do in porno that are absolutely horrible. So you can't use porno as a, uh, a de facto educational platform in and of itself because there's things that we do that we hate doing like we know they suck like I, I I'll tell people like anybody out there you know who wants to try pile driver position good luck it's miserable okay nobody likes it the girls don't like it the guys don't like it none of us like it is it visually appealing yes and so it comes back to you know, that's at the point where you're putting on your business hat and you're saying, okay, well, I am a paid professional and, you know, the, the viewing paying public wants to see this, so I'm going to do it. Um, but I would never advise any, um, anybody at home to try that. And I think, <clears throat> you know, 
that's one of the things that really people do need to sort of understand with porno. It's like, well, much like I wouldn't believe Schwarzenegger could could gun down, you know, 90 people with a, you know, with an M60 held in one hand, you know, we shouldn't necessarily believe that that certain positions or things that we do in a porno movie would be good in real life to do. I think that's actually a really beautiful point. Can we just use the next few minutes to kind of like debunk it? Like what is visually pleasing? Never try it home. What are things that actually work? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, one of the things, you know, definitely like, uh, things that I see, right. Um, if we're talking about anything that's, that, that goes in on funny angles, like, like pile driver position, horrible, um, I'm sure probably now you have a, a lot of guys that might get fixated with deep throat blowjobs. Why? I have no idea because, you know, all you're going to end up doing is like, it's not pleasurable for the guy, you know, not from my perspective, yeah. you know, it's, it's, so it's not pleasurable for the woman. It's not pleasurable for the guy. It's visually appealing. And that's about it. Um, you know, standing DPs, don't try that at home. That's certainly not, not any sort of fun, right? So you got a lot of these things where, you know, people think that because it, it looks cool, that it might be fun to do. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, what you need to focus on is, is positions that maximize clitoral contact, right? So I'm, you know, for me, that's the big three. And then, uh, and then outside of that, I always, I always say to my clients, I, I call it the big three plus one and plus one, I consider spoon, but there's other reasons why I like spoon position. You're, you're a big advocate of uh, missionary position. Oh yeah. Oh, Mish is, Mish is your, your, your number one. I mean, in, in so far as if you're going to really, um, if you're, if you're really going to be able to create uh, a whole experience you know, like if you're able to, to give the woman the, the experience of, of feeling submissive, if you're able to ravish her, if you're able to maximize clitoral contact, um, missionary is really one of the best things that you can do. The downside is that, you know, when we sort of look at it from almost like a biological perspective, it's the easiest one for us as guys, especially if we don't know what we're doing with it, to have an orgasm, Right. So it's the best feeling. There's no, um, there's no pain or pressure being put anywhere on our bodies. You know, anatomically, we're lining up great. And like I said, if we're, if we're, in, if, if instead of focusing on clitoral contact, we're focusing on the purely in and out of it, you know, for a guy, we might last 30 seconds, minute, right? If we don't know what we're doing. So that's the downside to starting with that position. And so, you know, when I have guys that I teach about being able to last consciously as long as you want to in the bedroom, because I think so many guys get wrapped up in this concept of I need to last forever. And I mean, I've worked with guys where they do last forever and they want to be able to come faster. I mean, you know, lasting forever uh, is not the panacea. It's, it's all context right? You know, if you're going to have a quickie in the, in the kitchen, well, two to five minutes would be great, right? Before the kids come home. Um, you know, and then if, if something more is required where it's like, okay, you know, we want to have 20, 30 minutes, then go for that. But I've noticed from my time in the porn business, um, the, the amount of time where a woman would start to feel sore before it would go to a, you know, 10 on the pain scale is very short. You know, I think, I think from, um, from a physicality standpoint, you know, man's penis can take a lot more, you know, quote unquote damage, so to speak. Like you can go for a lot longer without necessarily feeling the pain than as a woman. So what I've noticed with, with a lot of guys, if they struggle to be able to have an orgasm whenever they consciously want to, you know, they're having sex and suddenly, you know, the woman's like, Hey, okay, I'm starting to get a little sore. If they can't finish up quickly. And I mean, really quickly, 
well, then it becomes, you know, the, the woman's just like, get the hell off me. You know, like I'm sore now, like we're done. So yeah, lasting is lasting for hours doesn't do you any good either. So you really be, do have to be able to have control of it and be able to ride that line. Like I spoke about where, you know, at, at any time you could have an orgasm and you're consciously choosing not to. A, a concept that I that I always use with my clients is is resensitizing the the, the penis, and I, I, w I wonder if that's maybe a different way of how you sort of instruct your clients as well to sort of resensitize themselves so that there's more consciousness in what they're doing with their with their, with their tool more than anything else. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's um, there's definitely resensitizing it, and then there's also so I look at it from two perspectives, right? Like if if they're taking a long time to be able to have an orgasm, then it's definitely resensitizing. And I think it's definitely um, sort of retraining your neurology. And and I don't know how it's been for you, but I know from, from my experience, most of the guys that I've worked with, with that problem, it's mostly a guilt and shame thing. But that's what I've seen to be sort of the fundamental piece backing that is, you know, it, it's this, it's this, sort of narrative to like, like, if I can't last forever, I am unworthy. And so they go so far to the other side of it, hmm. that, that they're not even it, they're, they're having sex, but they're not even feeling their dicks. It's like, it's not even there. You know, and so if you've separated yourself from the feeling for so long, like, how do you get yourself suddenly like on cue back into it? Very difficult. Which which is dealing with the guilt and shame. I I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Toby, it's the yeah. same for you. What's that? Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting area of the like guilt and shame. And I mean Eric, you're also you've mentioned a few times kind of riding that wave or riding that line sort of like consciously. Um do you want to speak into this a bit more, this whole like how to yeah, basically release that guilt or shame or like well what what kind of mental approach you're using to be on that line of like really being super, super present without ejaculating and then the party being over. Well, I think for me, it's, it's always been, you know, even more so than it, it, one part is being present, but then the other is really start starting to understand what will work with your body in the moment. Right. Because again, you know, my experience is mapped totally different than most others. Um, everything that I learned and, and my approach to it is based on necessity. Like I show up there on because myself and all the top actors, you, you could probably not find one top actor in the world who has not, um, you know, been sensitive or, you know, been on set and you start the scene 30 seconds in, you're feeling the urge to have an orgasm, right? And then it hits you and you kind of look at that clock and you say, wow, I got another 59 minutes and 30 seconds to go. Well, I better figure this out somehow. Otherwise, I'm not getting paid. Right. And so it, it's a whole different perspective shift that most people don't have to deal with in, in the bedroom with their significant other. Right. It's like, you know, it, it's one thing. Right. Like, OK, you know, if you if you only last a minute, you know, you can say, oh, so, sorry, babe, I'll get you next time or let me go down on you. Like you've got something else. There's nothing I can tell to a a whole production company and 20 crew members standing around, you know, and, and everything that's going on to say, hey, you know what, guys? Sorry, I screwed up. That doesn't exist. Um, so you're really forced to say, OK, well what can I do now? What, what, what steps can I take to mitigate and change this? And that was where I came up with sort of a different system of things. Right. Um, and that's where I broke it down into, okay, like I have the ways that I will fundamentally alter my neurology from a more of a long-term perspective, you know, and that has to do with, you know, conscious masturbation, penis exercises, maneuvers of consciousness. Um, but then there's the, things I call the dirty biohacks, which are in the moment things that you can do to prevent yourself from coming in the moment, right? And give yourself some agency and be able to last. And, uh, and you know, that goes from uh, pain, prevention of your testicles rising, 
to depth, all these different things where you can really like give yourself another minute, another 30 seconds, another minute um, to be able to get to what I found and, and what I talk about in the book, which I, I consider the five minute marker, because that for me was that was the t- the amount of time that a guy needed to get to 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 really have the desensitization occur that they needed to be able to now sort of you know grab the grab the beast by the horn so to speak and be able to steer it um because before that so it really does change the way you start to look at things like it's not like hey i need to last 40 minutes it's like no bro five minutes let's get you from because that 0.01 seconds of penetration to five minutes that's the danger zone after that we can start to work with things right and you start to your own body starts to regulate itself but before that it's it's you're in no man's land and you're just like oh god i'm so sensitive i can't control this thing and that's where you need to use like i said pain the prevention of testicles use the depth use your positioning all these things because even with positioning in every moment you will always find a position that feels worse than the one that you're in you just have to discover what it is and that becomes individual right but so many guys get stuck in the sense of you know they're they're in a position and they don't know what to do and they don't really realize that hey you know what i have options i have things that i can do right but if you don't know that you have options you're just stuck and you're like oh god i'm gonna come and then it it, it's over right so there's a there's a big piece of understanding your body there's a big piece of strategy You know, I mean, even from that perspective, if you know going in that you're feeling sensitive, I always tell my clients, I'm like, worst position first. Why would you start with the best feeling position of all time and 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 not set yourself up for success? I think when you speak about your positioning, it's it's an interesting one as well. Coming back to the beginning of the conversation where it's around really satisfying your partner. And then it's, it's it's. at least from my experience, it's a sort of like trade-off between like, yeah, what might be a position that feels shit for me while potentially not feeling like shit for her, but like elevating her on her journey. And so I feel that's sort of in, in a committed relationship, sort of the, I think, trade-off that you're beginning to, to see like, ah, oh, yeah, this is what would work for her. Like what are the areas that I can, I can step into that draw out that sort of, and I think that five minute mark, that's definitely in my experience as well. I, I love that you, um, you, yeah, if you say it like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, even, even when we're, when we're looking at positions that, that, that are working for her, um, even just utilize, utilizing things like depth, right? Depth can be a huge game changer, right? Because again, the the my big premise is we want to maximize clitoral contact and minimize your sensations at least until she's fundamentally gotten off and and you've been given the quote unquote green light right up until then what we really want to do is how do we how do we minimize our sensations and maximize hers and there's a lot of different ways that we can do that with positioning too right because we've got a lot of different options at our disposal i mean even even if if we're thinking about it from the terms of 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 a doggy position you know okay one would think well we're in a doggy position we we're we're not able to stimulate the clit yes we can because we reach our hands around and we can play with her clit right at at no point at no point should you not be stimulating the clit in some fashion right because that's what's going to help move her towards the goal posts and it'll keep you away from them right if we're if we're just you know if it's if if all the focus is on you then well yeah it's probably going to be a lot harder to get to that five minute marker and you know well now is she going to be able to finish before you do so really in in every situation the the clitoral contact needs to be maximized and that really needs to be where your focus as a man is the entire time I, it, it's Toby, you highlighted it before about sort of the scientist approach, and I think I think it's it's something that all men have to sort of adopt is really being scientific with their bodies, their situation. Take it as as you know a unique and individual experience, and be curious with that because I think there's so much information. Like you're pointing out, depth for me is something you know most people don't consider because they're always stuck on the thrusting side, 
rather than sort of you can be there's a biting point within depth that you know let's say for instance it's you you're completely pressed like you're saying that that it's uh, the clitoris is rubbing on on your pelvic bone or something like that and there doesn't need to be so much thrusting at that particular point and that gives you that extra minutes three minutes five minutes equally the bodily bodily contact of closer emotionality there too yeah well i mean and that was what i started to notice right it was like okay I always noticed that, you know, if you were, if you were in the woman all the way, there seemed to be almost like a little, like a tiny little gap of extra space, you know, towards the cervix, right? So it's like, okay, like if the head of my dick can hang out there, now I'm not being, I'm not being, um, I'm not feeling so many, so much sensation, right? But now I've got the benefit that I can, I can just totally grind my pubic bone right up against that clit nonstop. So I don't need to be stroking. So I'm minimizing my feelings and minimizing my sensations. But now I'm in a position where I can maximize hers. Well, that's a win-win. And it gives me a little place where I can just hang out. The head, of my, the head of my penis can hang out, get a little respite, get a little breather, right? If I'm on the edge, I can just hang out there for a little bit and use depth to, you know, be able to make a comeback and say, okay, you know, now I was at a nine and a half. Oh my God, right? Oh, brought it back down to a seven. All right, let's continue. Let's keep pushing forward, right? And that's where I think you know depth can be used beautifully to do to to do that. You know, so it's it's there's not one thing that's going to be able to make you last longer. It's having all the tools in your toolbox available at all times, and then you're just cherry picking based on what the situation calls for and where you're at. How is your sensitivity today? What positions are going to work for her? What positions can you, you know, do that work for her, but as also work for you because you're going to know your body and you know, okay, well, I can't do this, but I can do this and that. Okay, let me go with those two to start. And then if I gather, you know, get the reins of it, so to speak, well, we can go back to the one that, that was problematic because probably by then it's not going to be. You know, if we've made it to that five minute marker, now you've desensitized. Now maybe you can do that position and you're like, okay, like this is, this is great. Now I've, I can do something. Um, and it's all sort of unspoken. So I just want to highlight something. So I, I Donna has been super active in, in, the, in the chat column and um, Eric, when I was looking through your book, you've had a lot of things around like clitoral stimulation. And so I don't know saying, um, it would be nice that guys learn how to simulate a clit. So if maybe towards the end, we can just go a bit into the different techniques so that we, we leave the gentlemen with something tangible that they can take to their women. And <laughs> I think that'd be quite awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. No problem. So, I mean, with the, um, what I've always found, if we're talking about from a pussy eating perspective, because I like to, I like to go into that. <clears throat> the one thing that I found through my experimentation tended to work the best is which it, what is what I ended up calling the cross T technique, and I labeled it that because essentially that was what was happening with the tongue, right? It, you're you were creating a sort of T formation nonstop, and so this is why you know as as I've spent all the years going down on women saying, okay, well, what, what's working and, and why is this working? And it seemed to me that, you know, when we, when we map the clit onto the dick in, in the, in the sense of, I find there's a lot more similarities be between the two of them than there are differences. Right. And I think this is sort of a good way to, to, to come at it. Because if we, if we look at, you know, even when we look at, at pussy eating, like I, I always talk about the, the, the three commandments of the vibrator, right? It's like women love vibrators. Why do they love vibrators? Well, you know, this, this is the three reasons that I've come across why women love vibrators. You know, number one, they stay on the clit, right? No woman is, is putting the vibrator on, you know, some side walls or going all over the place, wandering like a lost puppy. Every girl that I've ever known, you know, they get they get their Hitachi or whatever, whatever device it is, and they staple it to the clit. It's not moving. It's staying right there. You know, and that was one of the big things that I learned early on. It's like, well, if you've made the commitment to get a woman off now, you should not be leaving the clit for any reason, 
Like that's your that's your golden zone that you want to stay there, right? Because it would be the same thing. Like, you know, you could be getting a blowjob from a woman and everything's going along great and everything's fine. And then all of a sudden she decides she wants to, you know, go, you know, lick your balls. Well, suddenly you went from, oh, I was ready to have an orgasm to, yeah, now we're back to zero, starting all over from scratch, right? So why would you go do that to them from the same perspective? Um, and then, you know, the second thing is, well, you know, if we look at vibrators, they're, they're consistent in their power and their rhythm, right? You know, it's like a girl, she hits her setting, whatever the power setting, whatever vibration setting, and she leaves it there. And it's, it's, it's steady. It's never moving. It's not like, you know, erratic, like it's going a million miles an hour, one second, and then crawling at a snail's pace the next. So you learn, okay, well, rather than being, rather than trying to do something overly, you know, special in the bedroom, what I should be doing is I should just be really consistent with what I'm doing and be able to maintain that and not break that rhythm. Because once you have the right rhythm and you have the right pressure and you have the right speed, all you have to do is just continue that all the way until, until you get towards the orgasm, right? Like when, when you, it's just, it, and that's why I said it maps so much the same. Like, you know, you you could have a girl where she's doing the most amazing thing and you just think in your heart, in your head as a guy, like, just don't stop, just don't stop. Right. And then, you know, she might, you know, all of a sudden stop because she needs to, you know, wipe her nose or readjust and she changes the hand grip. She changes everything she was doing. And now it's not the same. And, and now you're just as far away as from an orgasm as, as 10 minutes ago. So, you know, we have a lot of these things where it's it, the, the two systems map so well, but we don't, tend to look at it from that perspective. We always look at it like, oh, this, this, this other person, right, you know, is totally foreign and, and just because their equipment looks different doesn't mean that it necessarily acts that much different at the end of the day, right? That's amazing. Really, really, really nice explanation. I, I'm, just, I'm just mindful that I have like another hundred questions to ask and... <laughs> 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 don't have the time but in terms of finding you eric i know we've put it in in to our link and we'll do it as well um i'd highly suggest everybody to get his book because not only does it have the instructional side but it has an amazing sense of humor in it as well um i mean interlude number three really had me um <laughs> but uh, yes the interludes if if you could let anyone know where to find you the the easiest place that would be would be amazing. Yeah, well everyone can find me at uh, ericeverhard.com or crushingperformanceanxiety.com. Uh that's my latest course where uh, where I teach guys basically everything that I've learned from the last 23 years on how to really overcome your fears in the bedroom and overcome whatever sort of anxiety that pre presents itself and how you can create positive feedback loops in your mind to be able to have that, what I call irrational belief in your penis. So yeah, either one of those they can reach out at me on and, uh, and talk to me and we can, we can go from there. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing this space with us. It's no, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. It was so, so good to be on here with you, good with you guys. And, uh, you know, it's nice to bring, uh, to bring this, uh, all the way from clubhouse. Now we're on here. So this is great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Thank Be you, well. Eric. And look up. All right. Take care, guys. Lots of love. Thanks, everyone, for being so active in the chat. See you soon.